recently the Earth and Time Report, which identified many scientific questions related to earthquakes <clears throat> and volcanoes as of the highest priority, and the Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction tries to address some of these. Uh, here's a list, not an ex exclusive one, such as what are the nature of megathrust disparities? How do we determine plate boundary coupling? How do we understand melt production? Um, and uh, how does uh, the transport and the storage of melt work all the way up to eruptions? What are the feedbacks between magmatic and surface processes? And, and, and how do we understand the long-term evolution of a subduction margin in terms of the volcanic and, and earthquake effects throughout the megathrust mega cycle? In the, in the context of uh, volcanoes, for example, we might then ask, well, how do we, how do we link an understanding of the long-term thermochemical transport in a subduction zone with a physical understanding of what is happening in the magma chamber and how does that relate to things we observe at the surface in terms of time-dependent gas fluxes? And how can we convert an integrative uh, understanding, an integrative physical model by means of assimilating data to build physics-based models that can be used for prediction? How can we predict volcano systems, volcano behavior um, in an integrative fashion? And so, the, the thought behind the modeling collaboratory is that what is really needed to, to bring observationalists, um, laboratory scientists, and modelers together to build comprehensive models that can capture the data, these very predictions. And one way to think about it is that, you know, one might think of building a, a digital twin of an actual subduction zone in the sense of a numerical representation that allows one to examine system behavior on a fundamental level, but also when applied to regional, um, to regional settings, to regional observatories for specific subduction zones for specific volcanoes. And so, you know, we've, we've, we've had large scale efforts in the solid earth sciences in the past, such as EarthScope, which have yielded uh, you know, fantastic data streams and, and, and outstanding structural models. But we're still left wondering you know, about the, the processes that control continental dynamics. And, um, and we still sort of need to uh, sort of close the loop for systems level understanding. And so the idea here is that one way to advance this is to have a large scale community effort to really bring about the systems level understanding. And then to do that with computational infrastructure that is both science driven with a specific problem, subduction zone systems, subduction zone dynamics, and science enabling, allowing us to do new science that we couldn't do before. And that's what the modeling collaboratory is about. And so a digital twin is something that has been used widely in engineering where we might have a virtual um, airplane uh, engine that can be tested and where we can predict failure before the real system fails. It's been used in modeling dynamics of urban environments and it's been used quite widely and more so in climate dynamics, where the idea is to build a physical representation of the system, assimilate data, and then predict these weather patterns here, where on the left there's an observation from a satellite, on the right is a numerical model predictions, right? And then we can use this to, to make forecasts and, and, um, and so on and query this system. Now, um, quite obviously in a, in a subduction zone where we're asking, well, how does an earthquake happen? How does a volcano happen? We're in a very different um, framework where not only <laughs> is it harder to obtain the, the, the data, is it harder to obtain the structural constraints, but we're also limited somewhat in our understanding of the physics, right? We do not know the system behavior. We do not know the, the fault constitutive laws to a degree that, you know, we know how the weather works. So there are different challenges and those challenges, you know, folks involved in fault and effort think are, are not, shouldn't preclude us from, from attempting to build these systems level models. And so um, we need to approach the, the problem differently. And we hope to do so in a joint fashion by bringing together observationalists and modelers to address these remaining physics questions, 
agiles and data assimilation will have to be further explored. And the um, idea here is that by trying to capture these processes, both in, both in isolation, and then by coupling these different bits and pieces of the system, we understand more about these interactions and we will have a framework to test different suggested physical approaches to, to capture the system, um, answering these questions that are in the, in the in the chorus report as to what is an earthquake, how do volcanoes work, what is the effect of landscape evolution on the system in the SC40 observational context. And so the idea is that this modeling collaborative for subtraction is a perhaps a, a framework of, of, of numerical codes, um, sort of like a, like a Lego set where you have different pieces that are validated and can be put together in different ways, can be put together in a way to allow study of the fundamental physics, where you might worry about the dynamics of an asperity in isolation, but it could also be put together for a regional system where we have new observational data streams and we might ask questions such as to the interpretation of transients that are observed seismically or geodetically. So both regional data assimilation, fundamental physics, uh, empowered by large-scale community effort, um, and uh, importantly, you know, it's not just about the code, but it's really about building a community to allow for those collaborations between the disciplines and to empower a new generation of researchers and grad students to conduct this research by being familiar with each other's tools, for example. It has to be a, an international collaboration, of course, at least because we want to compare different regional settings, different national laboratories, and it's meant to follow best practices in terms of having not just an open and fair environment, but also fair in the sense of data model distribution. And um, it, it, is, it is meant to, to advance the science, but also help with capacity building in the earth sciences and address issues such as the lack of diversity in the earth sciences. And um, uh, in this sense, uh, the hope is that the um, modeling collaboratory will be part of a larger effort where we can think of computational geosciences as another entry pathway right, that might make it easier to bring in students um, into the geosciences, uh, maybe sort of complementing the sort of the field-based, uh, let's go camping with bearded white people like myself, and as opposed to let's draw from people who, you know, from, from communities where this is not a natural thing to do. And here's where I would like to hand this over to Mike Brzezinski to talk a little bit more about our JEDA related efforts and how we think of the modeling collaboratory um, and, and the JEDI focus group that he's leading as the, some of the, the, the cross-cutting efforts within SE40. So Mike. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Torsten. I, you know, again, uh, a pleasure to have a chance to sort of talk about some of our efforts broadly with SC4D. But I mean, I, I think MCS has done a fantastic job of identifying opportunities for diversifying geoscience, right? Th this computational pathway idea is excellent, not just in that it's a different way to recruit and potentially feed the pipeline, right? But this point you got here about inclusive and scalable is, is really important, right? That there's a limited number of opportunities to do field work depending on where you live and what access you have. And so computational opportunities can potentially be more inclusive and can potentially scale to, to much larger numbers than we could potentially bring to the field. So, you know, this is, I think, a great jumping off point for talking a bit about what SCE4D has been trying to do in terms of working on this. So the next slide is just a bit of an introduction for what we've been doing with SC4D. So we've generated uh, another integrative group within the SC4D structure. This is Building Equity and Capacity in Geoscience. Um, we've purposely chosen a name that isn't just education and outreach. Those things are valuable to us, but we're recognizing that SC4D has a, a particular opportunity to really build capacity. Uh, and I think the, the large scale of it also has a chance for us to build equity. So we've tried to focus on that uh, in, in the name. I think you know it's it's also relevant to talk about sort of what, what our charge was you know to try and identify the correct set of activities that are useful for the assets of SC4D. But I think as we've started to meet, we've recognized there's there's an intrinsic goal to really kind of transform the mindset 
of our community about these these different aspects, you know, education outreach, uh, Jedi, uh, capacity building. We recognize these things as critical for successful science, and right. And so, if we want to really sort of uh, burst over to sort of new new sort of uh, opportunities and new uh, abilities to hit new heights in terms of what we can do scientifically, we really have to embrace this, this aspect, right? And so I think, again, the way the MCS is thinking about this in terms of a modular community system science is very much in line with this. And part of why I'm here today is to just try and champion this aspect of building a community that can work together uh, and, and having uh, pieces of the science uh, built in different ways that can work together, thinking about how those integration pieces happen uh, is very much what we're interested in. So if you go to my next slide, I want to just touch on a couple of the, the sort of key targets um, for our group. Um, I'm referring to them as research targets because th these are not just, hey, we have to just go do these things, right? These are things that are going to take some time to learn more about, and that's why we've tried to set them out as, as things we can sort of focus on as part of our research, right? That for SC4D, MCS to be successful, learning more about these things is going to, to enable that, right? So things like leveraging international efforts into sustainable capacity building partnerships, right, that avoid colonial attitudes, right? So again, this is certainly a component in terms of what happens sort of out in the field, sort of on, on boots on the ground, but I, you know, I think it extends to the other aspects of how we do geoscience, right? So uh, trying to sort of understand better ways to do this and learn from uh, mistakes in the past, I think is something that we, we can really sort of champion. Another aspect is this uh, looking at ways to sort of envision our science in a way that can help address social justice and equity issues, right? So again, as physical scientists, we're not gonna solve uh, social justice issues, but we can think about ways that our science can really enable uh, that to improve. Um, other things like educational efforts and outreach, uh, trying to think about those in new ways, trying to do better measurements of student learning outcomes, assess uh, is a, a key aspect of what geoscience ed researchers are telling us. And so I think that's something we need to be thinking about in terms of how we try and accomplish some of these goals. Uh, and this last part, I think, is really uh, relevant for, for our S MCS community, right? They're trying to identify and develop evidence-based practices, best practices for interdisciplinary collaboration, right? I, I think you guys have already demonstrated that the workshops have worked because of uh, trying to sort of create the space and time for folks to, to work across discipline, right? And so some of that comes from known best practices, but I think we can, going forward, better collect the data to identify for our community, based on evidence, what works better and what does not. What, what are the areas that, that we have blind spots to? What are the things that we can really do to accelerate how well we work uh, across disciplines? So I, I think there are some, some key opportunities that you all have already started to recognize and, and certainly uh, SE4D community is, is behind you in that. I can go to the next thing, I think. Most awesome. Th thanks, Mike. M most definitely. I'd like to hand it over to Leif Kallstrom, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the RCN component, how we've so far started to think about some of the aspects of the MCS. Great. Thank you, Thorsten. Thank you, Mike. Um, so this is this is the uh, modeling collaboratory for subduction RCN steering committee. A bunch of squares here, <laughs> much like we are on Zoom. Uh, I guess you know this is to emphasize that we're representing, hopefully, uh, all all sort of aspects of subduction zone research, um, folks from different career stages, different subdisciplines. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this MCS RCN, of course, is uh, part of the umbrella SC4D, um, at, which also includes an RCN for community network uh, for volcano eruption response, Converse. Um, the MCS, of course, uh, is focused largely on modeling um, and was tasked or developed the uh, plan to do several workshops covering um, themes that uh, are important for subductions on science, uh, as well as a series of cyber infrastructure webinars, collaboration webinars. Um, some of this has been, of course, disrupted by COVID, um, but so far two workshops have been completed. There was um, one workshop on fluid and melt transport. Sorry, go back. Yeah, um, uh, in 2019, uh, one um, that was at the University of Minnesota in person. Uh, one on megathrust modeling um, at the University of Oregon, and then a workshop that uh, just finished. Um, it's done in a virtual format 
uh, on volcano monitoring. So those are sort of the three pillars of, of the workshop activities associated with this um, OCM. We had good uh, community participation and at all three. Uh, there's reports associated with each, each workshop. We'll talk a little bit about those going forward. Um, so if you go to the next slide here. Um, note, I guess, in contrast, perhaps to the SC40, there was not an explicit uh, yet um, uh, landscapes and seascapes component of this. In part, uh, this is because there are some good ideas that already came out, at least on, in, on the long time scales, uh, the coupling of, of landscape evolution um, to tectonics, long term tectonics, um, or the product of this uh, white paper here, um, CSDMS and CIG. Uh, there is going to be a um, smaller workshop later this year focused on um, the shorter term things that are um, brought up in the, the SC4D working groups currently thinking about this topic. So landscape response to, to faulting, to volcanic eruptions, to landslides, this sort of thing. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that um, the draft reports for, for SC4D really do uh, align quite well with the MCS from a, from a landscapes and seascapes perspective. There's lots of opportunities for um, this being a kind of integrative um, research topic uh, for which modeling can play a, a strong role. Uh, so this, this joint work, workshop with the Landscapes and Sea Scoops group is probably going to be a fall of 2021 format to be determined, but keep an eye out for that. Um, okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Great. So um, now I think we're going to sort of step through the the workshops that have happened, just to give you a, a brief summary of the progress that's been made so far. So I'll summarize uh, workshop one, which uh, I helped organize with uh, Google Wada. So this was a workshop surrounding fluid transport in subduction zones, which uh, in some ways is a great place to start because fluid transport is, is certainly a unifying framework for subduction systems. Um, so all, all groups within the SC4D um, certainly have something to say about fluid transport. Um, and, and perhaps this, this represents a nice common research framework, right? things like the control and magnitude of um, eruption and earthquake hazards we could think about in the fluids context. Uh, some of the things that were highlighted in the uh, report that came out of this workshop, um, we need a better understanding of processes that control fluid migration, a huge range of sc scales. Um, this is, this is going to be a grand challenge that probably will extend far beyond <laughs> the uh, SC4D, whatever it becomes. Um, but, you know, this sort of helped start talking about what we might do as a community from a modeling uh, perspective to make progress on these, these huge problems. Um, so community modeling resources were discussed um, and, and certainly uh, emphasized that, that we need a, a framework for model validation and benchmarking. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about the value of cross-disciplinary training and knowledge exchange there as a critical component for making progress here. Um, I think that's all I have to say there. Thanks a lot, Lee. I want to hand it over to, to Eric Dunham now to briefly uh, summarize the um, main points of the Megathrust workshop, which is our second completed workshop. And all of the material is online on our webpage. Eric. Thanks. Yeah, so Amanda Thomas and I organized the, um, the Megathrust workshop in October 2019 and, and uh, somewhat recently published a, a white paper on it. Um, at that workshop, it, it was pretty, one of the emerging ideas from that workshop is that there, there's a great opportunity and a need to, for, um, for an integrative uh, community building effort. Um, to, that would provide sustained focus on subduction zone earthquake and tsunami hazards, um, or really more generally in, in the structure and deformation behaviors um, that occur in subduction zones. Um, there was the idea that we might develop focus groups. These focus groups could be organized in different ways. Uh, they could be focused on certain regions, right? Integrating across the range of hazards and processes and, and such that are occurring at that at that region, um, as well as uh, focus groups focused on processes, um, right, that may occur in, in different forms or same form in across multiple subduction zones. And that might include looking at the, the mechanics of slow slip events, how ruptures navigate all the complex structures that exist in the subduction toe, um, such things like that. 
Um, there's obvious synergies with the SE40 um, observational efforts and instrumentation efforts. Um, those would be everything from developing community models and maintaining those models for the structure, properties, rheology, et cetera, of the given subduction zone being instrumented, um, developing and utilizing models to interpret the observations, and then using modeling to guide uh, future instrument deployments. Um, but at the same time, it was also recognized that MCS needs to go beyond just, just the SC40 supporting role in, in the SC40 instrumentation efforts, right? There's many, many unanswered questions about subduction zones, everything from long time scale geodynamic um, modeling to understand what sets the structure, pressure, pore, uh, stress and such. Um, as well as short time scale models of dynamic ruptures and tsunami generation. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the recommendations that, that you'll find in, in this Megathrust report. Thanks a lot, Eric. Heading it over to um, Kyle Anderson, who uh, with Helge Gunnemann uh, has been in charge of our recently completed Volcano Systems Workshop, fabulous webinars, all presentations online, and the report is ongoing. And so, Kyle, if you want to add a uh, comments on that one. Yeah, thanks, Thorsten. So, yeah, starting uh, last September, uh, Helga Gunnarman and myself convened a series of webinars and planning meetings really focused on laying the groundwork for the volcano part of MCS. Uh, we organized the meetings around five themes, uh, crustal scale magma transport, magma storage, eruptive magma ascent, eruption plumes, and the final one was integrative volcano modeling and forecasting. Uh, I think these are really a success. We had some great presentations from the speakers and more than 200 attendees from many of the webinars. So it was a transition for us from what was originally gonna be an in-person workshop. And I think it was a bit of a pivot that was a bit sudden, but in fact, it worked out well and that we were able to open it up to a broader uh, part of the community, I think. Um, you know, as Leif said, our last webinar and planning meeting was just last week, and we're now in the process of taking all the input from those meetings and turning them into a report and a final planning document. Uh, a draft version of that is available on the MCS website, and we are soliciting input through the end of this month, uh, both in the form of comments and even long form text. So please let us know if you're interested. Um, because the report is still in progress, I think the volcano part of a future MCS is a bit more fluid than some of the others. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, the community has really advocated for some things that I think will certainly make it into the report. Uh, some of them are listed on the slide here. They include grants for model development and collaboration, possibly at the PI level. Uh, a real emphasis on getting interdisciplinary groups of people together to work on common problems, uh, whether focused around a volcano or a physical process or maybe a volcanic subsystem. Uh, one model that came up repeatedly was the, the CIDR summer schools. Uh, but many possible ways of doing that. There was another clear focus on supporting open source, reusable, verified, validated, and benchmark model codes. Uh, in some cases, these could take the form of model building blocks that could be connected with others to build larger system models. And then finally, the need for computational infrastructure uh, of some level to support all of this. So as I said, this is definitely still in progress. Uh, if you don't like what you see here or you have other ideas, please get in touch with Helga and myself and take a look at our draft report, which is very rough, I will admit at this point, on the MCS website. Uh, we'd really be happy to have your thoughts. Thank you a lot, Kyle. And, um, <clears throat> and this sort of concludes a brief review. And as, as, as you guys have noticed, if you joined us late, we've just sort of wrapped up some of our uh, discussion about the um, uh, the, the past efforts uh, of the M MCS, RCN, the ongoing efforts, and we would like to focus from now on to, to present to you um, the beginning of, uh, of a vision for what the MCS might actually uh, look like. And with this, I want to hand it over to Alice and, and Allison, who's going to um, sort of lead us through this part of the forward-looking um, part of the town hall. And that's the part that we really want to, to particularly get the community engagement right now. Okay, hey, thanks. Um, so as Thorsten just said, um, now we enter um, that part of the town hall where uh, we really would like to engage with all of you because we will go through um, the MCS design structure and program objectives as well as impact um, and float some 
um, ideas past you. So this first slide um, is summarizing that the MCS, as we've just seen, bundles physical mod models across scales and across disciplines, really to understand subduction zone processes. We are interested in, in modeling. We want to um, understand the equations that govern subduction zone processes. But it's also aiming to understand hazard and how to mitigate hazard better. And there's some example um, exemplary links on this slide um, of the MCS linked to mass wasting, to earthquake rupture, or to volcanic eruption dynamics, which directly link into lava flows, ash clouds, tsunami, and ground shaking. Um, so that is um, yeah, the impact that these um, MCS um, structure hopefully will have. Next slide, please. The MCS um, design object objectives to establish um, sustained computational geoscience community, um, which is supported um, and also um, can engage directly in model development, um, could look as follows. We define here as part of these Lego bricks um, two kind of focus groups. One is a natural laboratory focus group. So that could zoom in to certain um, community identified natural laboratories that can be studied across disciplines and across scales, focusing on this um, regional um, <coughs> natural laboratory, laboratory it can be process focus groups. So more um, yeah, subductions on process driven research questions that are tackled together. There's a building block that's uh, entitled subduction zone science integration. Um, there's code and cookbook development. So cookbook means that there are examples provided that um, will ensure that there's easy access um, as well as um, training and reproducible standards being established in everything that the MCS is developing that also links to workflows and access to computing. So help subduction zone researchers to access state of the art, um, for example, high performance computing or cloud based computing and also help with um, establishing um, <clears throat> workflows that are following um, best practices and training and outreach um, as was already highlighted by Mike before. Next slide. MCS um, can be seen as a subduction zone science hub for SC4D. So the MCS is here put in the middle um, as a subduction zone um, science integration and integrative hub that could link many of the other um, aspects that are, that are listed here. And uh, that can happen on a, a couple of levels, for example, via this uh, focus group, so natural laboratory, laboratory or the process focus groups um, can happen via working together on um, digital twin ideas um, by helping the SC40 observatories, for example, by um, hosting uh, these um, uh, community models and also by capacity building in terms of equity and um, um, modeling um, skills. And uh, we also see uh, the MCS as embedded in a larger um, international research environment that can, um, of course, include earthquake centers uh, such as SCEC, that can include um, international efforts such as CHI, such as the Europe European um, Center of Excellence for High Performance Computing and Solid Earth Sciences, um, CIDR, CIG, uh, CAGE, CSDMS, and others. Next slide. And. Um, <clears throat> We have um, on this slide um, summarized a couple of um, objectives that the MCS has um, in its design that include um, verification. So that could be um, paraphrased of are we building the system right? Are we um, solving the equations correctly, for example? Um, validation. So that means um, comparing um, our modeling efforts against data and checking if we're actually building the right system, are we solving the right equations or are we, do we have to rethink the way uh, we do modeling science and subduction zones. Uncertainty quantification is very important when we are thinking about hazard mitigation, for example, in a probabilistic sense, and optimal experimental design. And this is an important point where we can stress that modeling can actually be part um, of what we would maybe call the phase zero or the phase one um, steps of an um, observational based research program in helping to decide where to focus instrumentational efforts. And I think here I hand over to Alison. Great, thanks, Alice. Yes, hi, I'm Alison Duval. Um, and I just have a few more slides here um, before we move into our uh, breakout room discussions. So the steering committee has been reflecting a lot on all of the um, 
great uh, work that's been done through the workshops and through uh, the RCN efforts. And we've been trying now to think about what uh, the most um, appropriate and um, useful structure of the MCS would be. And what are the key programs that we wanna make sure um, are included in, in an MCS? Um, so you can see some of those, um, which we've also been hearing um, from Alice about as well that we've already touched on, but you know everything from um, support of, of database and workflow, uh, documentation uh, and cookbook, hardware support, um, HPCC allocations, um, postdoc and grad student programs. These are all elements that we um, have been considering as um, important pieces to an MCS. Um, next slide, please. Right, and um, as was also mentioned in terms of uh, the code itself in this sort of framework of um, a code, a series of code Lego kits, um, we've also been um, using the community input that we've been gathering to think about some example code Lego, kit, Lego kits that we would need in order to solve the fundamental science questions that we're interested in um, in SC4D. Um, and so you can see some of those here. And as I, you know, as I've said, these have risen, risen out of uh, these community workshops and um, events that we've been having. Um, so you can see here there are. Um, several different um, key elements or code Lego kits that we think uh, might be important. But of course, these are just examples. Um, so one of the things that we really want um, to keep engaging with you, the community on, including today and the breakout discussions are, you know, kind of what do we think are the most important both programs that, um, that we need to have as well as um, models or modeling kits that, that we think are important. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, the, the steering committee, as I mentioned, has been having these kinds of discussions um, uh, with community input. And we, I, we have here just sort of a, a straw person implementation. Um, so when we've been thinking about this, uh, some priorities prioritization has sort of risen up um, and, and we feel that um, some must haves that, that appear to be um, uh, potentially really integral to this effort would be workshops and collaboration between observationalists and modelers, um, structural and code database, a program manager, a coordinator of such an effort would be super important. Um, and of course, community-driven science committee. Um, you know, so this, this has to be a community effort. We've also noted some things that we feel are high priority. Um, so having programmers um, at a center and on loan to the community, sub awards for code development, um, outside of an SC4D program, um, computational allocations, and um, a postdoc program were seen as things that we consider to be a high priority. But again, you know, this is we're really at, a, at an exciting and important stage uh, of this planning where we absolutely need community feedback on what, um, what the community feels should be the highest priority. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, you know, as, as I was just saying, you know, we feel that the community um, is, is a super important piece to the MCS and uh, the, what we envision will be a community impact of MCS will be new large scale science driven and science enabling computational infrastructure. That's what, that's what we need. We need that to advance systems levels, um, systems levels problems. Um, and we, we really need this, we know that this is an integrative science. Um, and so we wanna complement and optimize new observational and laboratory efforts under SC4D with the modeling component. Um, and you know, computational geoscience is, is really important for physics-based hazard assessment and hazards is at the heart of the SC4D initiative. Um, and as, as Mike already mentioned, uh, we feel that the impact of MCS will be strong in terms of capacity building and enhancing diversity in the geosciences. Um, we wanna generate new opportunities for interdisciplinary research uh, with this effort. And we wanna leverage, uh, leverage and democratize uh, computational science advances. And so basically we, you know, we've, we've put out here some uh, possibilities, some examples, um, and what we want now, um, next slide please, uh, for the rest of um, this town hall is to actually have some breakout discussions where we get to hear back from you. And we have four key questions that we wanna address in the breakout discussions. So we wanna think about which MCS activities are the highest priority. We wanna think about which um, suggested MCS structures um, you think are well aligned with uh, the priorities. 
And we want to think about the MCS tools, codes, and repositories that would be most useful. Um, and finally, we want to make sure that the MCS um, is well aligned to ensure observations, um, including from SD4D, are best integrated into models. And we want your thoughts about that alignment. Um, we're going to have an opportunity for hearing directly your feedback and um, a bunch of us steering committee members are gonna be um, leading these discussions and scribing and recording those. But I also wanna make, um, to point out that there's a form that exists um, for your feedback. So some, some people might be more comfortable providing their feedback in written form or at a later time. Um, so you can use that form or you can email um, the steering committee uh, members directly with your feedback. I just want to make it clear that there's many opportunities for, for your feedback, including uh, starting with the discussions we'll have next. And I'm going to send it back over to Torsten before we move into the breakouts. Yeah, th th thanks a lot, Allison. Uh, I mean, uh, thanks everybody for the presentation. It's very well said. This is the part where we're hoping to have broad engagement. This is, those are some ideas. And uh, we're hoping to break into smaller discussion groups now. And I, I realize there are some questions and some comments in the, um, in the chat, such as relationships to CIG and CSDMS. And I, I hope that we can come back to those um, after the breakout, but we're going to open it up to general, general comments. And so um, Ariane has, uh, has, has generated breakouts. And we have um, assigned discussion leaders and, um, and and scribes, and so I hope we can uh, we can break into those breakouts now, and then reconvene in uh, what in twenty five minutes from now. Thanks, everybody. This was obviously a very compressed discussion, but maybe we can just um, go in order of the breakout groups, and I hope. Uh, maybe you can try to summarize so that we don't do one, two, three, four, but sort of highlight the major points starting with, with group one, if that's okay. So who was in breakout one? What if we don't know our numbers? Like we, <laughs> we, we, we were group one, but Magli, yeah. you took notes. So maybe I'll, do you want to? I'm going to try, but I'm, I'm not sure how I can summarize. I'll try to summarize. Okay. So for the, um, for the first question, which is, which um, suggested activities are highest priorities. Um, the two things that got um, got brought up were were the workshops that were mentioned in the list, um, as well as modeling, really prioritizing the modeling to follow the new data streams because that's where the low hanging fruit will be in terms of making big advances in our understanding. Um, for the second question, uh, is the suggested MCA structure well aligned? Um, there were, we talked a bit about pros and cons of SCEC. Um, and the idea, uh, I think one key idea that was interesting that came up was the, the idea of having not so much programmers that are focusing on developing a single code because that's putting too many resources in one basket, but more of a model in which having um, experts, uh, sort of either mathematicians, programmers, et cetera, that are, it can be kind of hired out as a consultant so that the the programming development model development is is being done by the individual scientists but they have a resource to go to um for the you know the the, the sort of the parts that they don't are they're not experts on um so that was i think one key point that came out of that uh, for the third point which mcs tools codes and repositories would be the most useful um uh one point that came up was that none of the data codes that were listed there um, had were um, data simulation or inversion codes. So somehow that got kind of missed in, in the process of making that list. Um, and also there was a distinction between like data uh, code repositories and, and, and making code and data discoverable, right? So that those kinds of are not the same point. Um, the last um, The last point on is MCS well aligned to ensure observations? I think the, the main discussion point there was that, um, hold on. Oh, yes, yeah, so, so that, so the question is whether MCS and SC4D should be really totally integrated. And the idea was to take advantage of those things that can be best shared between the two, the umbrella group and MCS, but to not limit the model development to only subduction problems. That's it. 
Awesome, thanks. Um, Kyle and, uh, and Kai were the leaders of group two. Okay, um, so let's see here. We um, just under item one, we sort of generally agreed that uh, the process focus groups and natural laboratories were kind of had to be thought of as almost central to those uh, everything and that then, you know, that leads to uh, th those problems that are posed, the process we're working on will lead to the other aspects such as code development and uh, et cetera. Um, we discussed, in fact, there seem to be kind of two categories of activities here, sort of community development, so developing a community to, that we can do science together, um, and then sort of the more technical development aspects and um, okay, uh, let's see what else. Um, there was uh, under the you know sort of resources question or rather uh, the MCS structure. Um, we we also discussed uh, SCEC quite a bit as well as a model pros and cons, but but also perhaps more importantly, there was a lot of discussion about the role of CIG. CIG already being our community where. For many of us where code development is going on and so um a fair amount of discussion about that and how um you know uh, explicitly how is CIG what CIG's role in this um it was uh noted that you know a, a community driven science committee alarmed a couple people not wanting the science to be prescribed, you know, that the community, you know, that we should, uh, there should be flexibility, freedom for scientists to explore the uh, scientific problems that they see worthy of exploration. Um, and that, that's more, those are the main points. Uh, it was pointed out that you know, there's a lot of focus here on forward modeling development. But there's the, you know, the data integration is very important and the development of community inverse methods, basically, to go from data to model is shouldn't be overlooked. I think those are the main points. Thanks, Kai. Um, maybe we, we can we hold some summary discussions and repartees until the end. So group three was Allison and, and me and I, I took the notes. We um, very much felt that it should be the observationals and modelers deciding whatever code development is supposed to happen. And then we mm -hmm. emphasize the, the role of, of workflows in the sense that being a repository for structural models such as the SCEC CXM is important, but in doing so, you realize that you can't just store stuff. You got to worry about parameterization. How do you use the models? And one way to address this is to establish uh, an archiving of a workflow, right? How were the data used to create the models? And in doing so, that allows asking about the, the sensitivity, asking about the assumptions, and, and that allows also to capacity build, right? Because if you're new to the field, you want to understand, is this a weak or a strong constraint? And if you have the workflow, then you can redo some of the analysis yourself super important. So the role of a center could be in terms of hosting that, in terms of documenting the workflow, working with PIs to shift the load from the groups um, in terms of um, providing cookbooks and documentations. And, and, and that part of thing is, of course, also where we can engage. We heard about CAG and CSDMS, but also the EarthCube community has worked a lot on, on, on workflows. Now, in terms of codes, and stuff that would be helpfully centrally developed, I think there was a lot of agreement that glues would be nice, like a petrological framework to link temperature to seismic velocities, mineral physics framework, rheological frameworks that are general and kind of science blind, sort of important, sort of kind of annoying to do, and the center could take care of that, whereas the more sort of hardcore code development would be distributed. And, and, and incidentally, as, um, it's, you know, the, this, the science committee idea is, is, is just to ensure that there is there's no mission creep. Um, we talked about, um, you know, teams for code development, how it would be nice to have groups of different you know, observations modelers get together to do the code development. 
And um, that was and the importance of benchmarking for verification validation. And we really couldn't make up our mind as to SC40 and the structure of MCS, really. So uh, group four is um, Alice and Leif. OK, uh, I took the notes there so I can take a crack at summarizing. Uh, definitely some common themes that have already been discussed. So I'll try to breeze over those. Certainly some questions in the topic one about how MCS is going to be related to CIG. Should MCS host codes? Um, is there going to be one you know, mega code that's going to be developed here or, or many small simple problems? Um, and that, that's relevant to the need for benchmarking. Um, related to that, I guess the, the point was brought up you know, is, is there going to be a product? <laughs> what, what's going to be the outcome of this? It's, you know, the, it was sort of mentioned, this is a very expensive enterprise, right? So is, is there going to be a, I don't know, attempt at um, estimating heat flow for geothermal resources or something like this? I don't know. That was one of the, the points raised. Um, kind of an interesting one, like analog to IPCC or something. Um, let's see, for point two, I guess, you know, there's raised there's pros and cons to a centralized structure. Um, easier to manage, but maybe I uh, can't be fully aware of the ideas from the community. Um, having math or computer science folks is great, but uh, some concerns were raised that these folks might be hard to find and retain. Um, so that needs to be thought about. Um, one, one practical thing uh, is, is maybe, you know, these, these type of people could help generating for example, scaling plots that one would need to get HPCC allocations or something like this if you have a code. Um, so sort of sort of a supporting role there. Uh, let's see, what else? A lot of support for um, workshops, training, this type of thing um, that might be a better structure for, for figuring out how to interface codes, data model, models, coordination, um, that MCS could be really well sort of a uh, place to do that. Um, and a lot of support for thinking about new physics and new bottling capabilities. Um, concern was that there's not many incentives to do this otherwise in the current funding cycle. Um, in terms of the last one, I guess the question was, you know, maybe we didn't decide, but but there was support for this, this idea that SC40 should be structured in, you know, from the beginning in such a way that models and observations are, are fully coupled um, get the most bang for your buck out of that. So uh, one comment was, was that this, the proposed budget that was put on there is above the CIG budget. So is it realistic? Uh, okay, um, th thanks. Um, then uh, the last breakout room was run by Chuck and Eric. Right, so there was definitely a unanimous consensus that the, the highest priority activity is, is to bring together the observationalists and modelers um, and form that community that, that, that is badly needed. Um, there were some cautionary tales about, about just having a team of programmers that can be farmed out to many people. Um, some that have experience in code development have pointed out that the best results come from people the pro, you know the programmers really understanding the physical problem the the modelers really you know understanding that the uh, the coding um, and some also some cautions about trying to make overly complex models right sometimes the more minimal models for a, a narrower problem are, are maybe more fruitful um, it was also pointed out that that the identification of questions in LNS is, is still somewhat lacking in contrast to the other areas of MCS. Um, so I think that we're all looking forward to the, the possible workshop that, that will be upcoming. Um, and then uncertainty quantification also got brought up, understanding what, what aspects of models can be constrained and what which cannot. Right. Thanks. So uh, thanks to all the participants and, and, and moderators. Um, I, I'd like to have us open this up for sort of general comments in, in a second, but, but please keep in mind that obviously this is only the start, um, but we're on a fairly 
uh, accelerated schedule. So our hope is to get feedback on the questions from the breakouts, the overall structure and so on over the next two weeks or so. So the online feedback form will be open for two weeks. Then the, the modeling collaboratory steering committee is gonna meet and try to condense and, and see what we have as sort of a community consensus should one arrive. And then following up on that, there's an SC40 um, all hands in like what, four weeks or something like that, um, uh, where we hope to represent that. So this is our timeline. And if you don't get a chance to, um, to speak now, and you haven't gotten a chance, reach out to any of the steering committee members who will then bring this up in, in the process. And so I, I guess I'm just gonna open it up for general comments right now. Diana. Well, I brought this up in our breakout, but I'll bring it up again. It seems like modeling here has been somewhat defined as computational modeling, but is that explicitly exclusion of analog modeling? No, not at all. So, so I think we, we are really talking about modeling in the broadest sense, right? Whenever you say a model, we want it. We want to, we want a, a conceptual model. We want an analog model, a numerical model, but also a structural model repository, right? And so the idea is if a model, um, serves to understand something about the earth from observations most excellent right and that can be all of these we haven't really um discussed well we have had of course many people from uh, who do analog models at our workshops and but we haven't really sort of grappled with analog models as a specific sort of thing to integrate right we've sort of dealt with them as 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 part of modeling, as many of us do, right? We, we go to analog models to benchmark on numerical models, for example. And analog models can be can be hugely important for, for teaching, for sure, right? Because it's a very different experience um, of, of watching a tank experiment than from, you know, running silly computer program. But I feel like there's something else behind that. It, it doesn't have to be numerical, no way, right? I'm trying to monitor um, raised hands. James Conder. Uh, to, to that point, I think it's a really good one um, that if, if we're trying to define modeling in this really broad sense, it seems that that almost does put a strike against trying to incorporate a whole bunch of mathematicians and dedicated computer programmers, because then you're already allocating certain resources to one specific kind, and there's not that kind of equity for things like analog or conceptual models. So I think it's a, it's a definitely a, a very important point to um, keep in mind, especially if you are doing this, this really broad definition of modeling. Yeah, I think we, we certainly have to have to prioritize and then see how any investment will best serve the the community um, and so on. so i'm not seeing any Any hands right now? Oh yes, um, Ben Guan and then uh, Aryan. Okay, I just have a very basic question, but I think I ha have some idea now, but I still want to hear from uh, you guys about the relation between SZ40 and MCS. And uh, because I studied it late relative to you guys. So although I have some idea, but I still want to have uh, you guys say that I should have a kind of a clear right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, there's, there's a clear answer for, for that one. Now, there is a clear answer in the sense that the modeling collaborative for subduction was envisioned as one of the three parts of the SC40 report, which was on an observational uh, strategy for earthquakes, volcanoes, landscape evolution, a science program, 
and an integrative modeling effort informed by um, uh, you know, past successes and failures in terms of getting to a process level understanding. Now, um, you know, as, as, as C40, so you, you can see the, um, the MCS sort of is going across the programs of SC40, just like um, the, um, the, the, the Jedi and capacity building focused efforts we heard from Mike Rosinski before. And I think there's a, there's a general feeling that um, the MCS should certainly serve the SC40 science integration demands, the model and workshop storage command demands, the serve the platform the RCN has already done, bringing together the modelers and the observationalists to better define the science. Um, and then there is a there's a, there's a strong feeling, as we heard from some of the breakouts, that it would be good that MCS type of efforts were not limited to SC40, in particular when it comes to these glue-like tools that we talked about, when it comes to any sort of new framework development where you know, if you're interested in rifting, you should be able to just reverse the boundary conditions and the same sort of tools should work. And, 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 and how to find the, the, the balance there and, and, and where the, the MCS might reside if it has a structure, if it's distributed, that's very much to be determined. And, and we're looking for input for the community on these things. And anyone should feel free to, to, to chime in, right? And, and we don't really have the time, regrettably, right now to sort of review the facets of, of SC40 right, right now. And I encourage you to, 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 to look into the material that, 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 that's available there. Helga has, it, has his hand up. Yeah, I, I wanted to respond to Diana's question uh, about, uh, I guess, analog models, which really are experiments, uh, laboratory experiments. Um, I mean, certainly the collaboratory part of, of the MCS, the C part, right? I mean, uh, that should include all kinds of collaboration and, and, and most definitely includes uh, experiments of, of any kind. But I think within sort of the modeling part, right? I, I, I think we're really talking about numerical modeling of various kind types. Um, and I don't quite see how, right? Um, analog experiments, again, I, you know, analog models are experiments. They require a lab, a dedicated lab, and, and, and so forth. So I, I don't quite see how the modeling collaboratory would, you know, directly facilitate that kind of experimentation. Also, of course, in terms of the collaboration aspect, it could. Yeah, I, I think that the latter part is, is important. And I mean, like no one has any answers here, but if you, for example, think of the modeling collaboratory of having something like a, like a grant program that's a little bit steered with the overall system science objective, then, then for sure, right? It would seem like a great idea to sponsor a postdoc or a grad student who's working with an analog lab and an observational person and numerical modeler to bring some integrative stuff together or to have some of the workshops at a place where there is a nice analog facility and have the grad students and the practitioners do analog and numerical experiments. So, so, so for sure, right? But, but I, I guess what, what Helga is saying, right? We're not talking about building a big analog modeling facility here. Right? For, for, for one, not because it maybe is, is a bad idea, but because it's just, it's just hard to scale up and, and, it, and it's hard to have it be general. If you, if you raise your, your virtual hand, I'll, I should be able to spot you. If you raise your actual hand, I may not see you. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit over time, but I don't wanna, um, I, I, I said to, to Emily's question, you know, we would come back to that. What, 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 is, what are the links with, with CRG? And I think the, the, the sort of the general question is uh, where, where where do we go in terms of uh, computational one of the questions is where do we go in terms of computational geosciences and how do we best uh, partner with existing organizations like CIG 
CSDMS, where many of us here on the call are, of course, very active and where, where a lot of things are happening right now and other you know, efforts such as EarthQ. And, and, and where do we see this going? But I, I think we, we already heard many, many comments as to the, the science-driven, science-integrating functionality of the modeling collaboratory that, that is just not part of these other efforts because they, they, they just can't, right? They just don't have the resources and they have different objectives. And, and we're really talking about enhancing collaboration on the problems that are associated with subduction on science and bringing us closer to building these physical models we can use for hazard assessment, which is which is the one of the driving philosophies of SC40. And how can we build these models? Right? And this is not something really that that uh, the existing computational community efforts could do in in their in their present form, of course. But but for sure, you want to make sure that you know, partnerships are, are built also with organizations like CIDR, right? We're talking a lot about capacity building. We're talking a lot about building a new community and we want to make sure that, that we are we have our efforts aligned best, right? And so that that is sort of one of one of the answers there. And, and then sort of depending on, on the objectives, right? Sort of as other organizations, then you, you of course want to make sure to engage with such as the earthquake centers, right? Assuming plural, there or, or a singular one, right? right? Right now we have the Southern California Earthquake Center, there might be other earthquake centers and how do we align uh, the modeling collaboratory best in that overall landscape, right? And so if, if others want, want to comment on that. Silva. Yeah, so we have similar discussions at CIG on how we can help uh, ESC4D and modeling collaboratory effort. And um, one thing um, CAG does already is to kind of organize the community around codes. And, um, and one thing it doesn't do is to organize the community around models. Um, and there are some concerns about doing this um, because uh, there's a little bit of a prescription, right? If we start having a model for certain subduction zone, it, there is attached to it like the the perception that it is the community model and nothing else is. Um, so perhaps there needs to be some sort of uh, mechanism to, like you said before, like parameterization of a model, like a model is not a, a dead product, but something that can be um, tuned and, and changed and explored uh, as a starting point, not as a final product. And, and so I think that's where this collaboratory can do something that's really different from CIG by organizing the community around um, how to best document a subduction zone, um, long-term, short-term tectonics, um, fluids, seismic cycles, and have a discussion around these models um, as opposed to simply having a model repository that is a little, a little bit inert, you know. Uh, so, so I think, I hope that it's something that the collaboratory will, will, will be successful at doing. Yeah, for sure, right? And this sort of motivates the this this thing with the Lego blocks that we keep talking about and, and the Lego kits. And so the idea is that you can think of an individual Lego block as a code that solves a simple problem that you might couple with another code while recognizing that it's not as easy as plugging one into the other. You can also think of that, that Lego block as a seismic tomography model that should exactly not be seen as static, but where let's say the seismic tomography model is more like putting a couple blocks together, data, inversion, result, parameterization, but you can reconfigure it, right? And so, so the, the hope is that there, there will be a repository, but a repository of workflows and a repository of well benchmarked numerical methods that allow the reconfiguration. Plus cookbooks and the cookbooks would be like, you know, recommended ways of assembling the Lego blocks to build a Cascadia model with fluid flow that accounts for the seismic information. And if you don't like it, take it apart, replace a Lego part, or just take a Lego block and run a Rift model with it. Take a Lego block or do a seismic inversion, geodetic inversion somewhere else. So this, this Lego thing is addressing this, this issue. And, and yeah. And so then there's, there's, there's a real, real question, right? Where in terms of the physics of the system, volcano earthquakes, 
where are we ready to put the Lego piece together? Um, and but as as you know, discussions within SCEC have shown, just trying to do stuff usually advances the science and it allows us to identify like which knob is missing of the Lego piece. You know, and by the way. Just completed my Bugatti. All right. Do we have any any other questions? Because we don't want to run long here, and I really appreciate that um, forty seven people at least stuck it out. Emily has a has the last comment. Okay. Thanks for letting me in. Uh, sorry. I, I just want to come back to the why subduction zone question, you know, because I can see everybody kind of having a hard time with this issue. Um, and I have a lot of sympathy for why everybody would have a hard time for this issue. I study earthquakes regardless of where they happen. And at some level, it's just rock breaking. I don't care if it's a subduction zone or not. Um, however, I mean, and so there are certain issues about subduction zones that are useful um in their concentration of hazards in the fact that we have seen um more precursory activity for earthquakes there than we have elsewhere and in i think probably most importantly in the ability to control the long strike variables and to use them as a natural laboratory where the dials are better controlled than a lot of other systems um but to me, none of those are the most compelling reasons on why subduction zones. Um, to me, the issue is really that there's a finite number of us people in the community, and there's a very large planet out there. And so um, we could do better if we concentrate our efforts on some relatively small chunk of it and actually do that multidisciplinary thing that we all keep asking for. And we can't actually do that multidisciplinary thing if we're all looking at different faults and different volcanoes in different parts of the world. So we have to pick something. Um, and it hardly matters to me if it's a subduction zone or a rift or a strike slip system or you know, uh, the Himalayas, which who knows what that is. Um, but it, what matters is that we're all looking at the same piece of dirt and that that's where we're going to make some real progress. So I guess I would advocate fairly strongly for getting under an umbrella together. Uh, pick your umbrella, but pick what we should have one. Um, and that it's really, otherwise this observational modeling thing's never going to happen. We're just going to be spread too thin. Earth science is a really, really small community. And that's sort of a more fundamental fact than anything else in my mind. Very well put. And, and I think a focus on a specific problem will, will certainly help to achieve what, what Emily mentioned in terms of bringing the observationalists and the modelers together, give us some guidance and lots of exciting questions inherent in the subduction problem for sure. So um, I'd like to wrap it up and thanks again to everybody. And please make sure to, once you've had like a good night's sleep to file your comments to please reach out to anyone on the steering committee and use the, uh, the form uh, you can, uh, that is accessible through our webpage the draft slides that look pretty much like what, uh, what we showed today are available there as well to remind you. Keep in mind, this is, uh, this is a, an open discussion and we very much reach out over the next two weeks and give us feedback. And thanks again to everybody for partaking in this. Um, and uh, I hope to see many of you in person soon so thank you thanks a lot